He reached his goal, but when he arrived, he found that a Norwegian team had beaten him to it. Disaster struck on the return journey, and his entire party perished in the brutal cold. Scott's final haunting diary entry shook the outside world. Had we lived, I should have had a tale of the hardihood, endurance, and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. For years after his death, Scott was regarded as a hero, a British icon who had shown courage and nobility in the face of insurmountable odds. But as time went by, critics began to question his aptitude, calling him an ill-prepared adventurer whose bad judgment had cost his team their lives. He was portrayed as irrational, consistently inept, a heroic bungler. I signed on to some extent to the legend of Scott the Bumbler when I first went to the Antarctic. But that legend just doesn't stand up against reality. Not when you get to know these guys, not when you look at the facts of what happened to them. Climatologist Susan Solomon has spent years in Antarctica studying the ozone layer. She became interested in Scott's story after a visit to his hut. Questioning the popular theory of his incompetence, she decided to try and find out what had really gone wrong on his expedition. Her conclusions were startling, for rather than confirming his mistakes, she revealed evidence of Scott as a careful planner with a deep faith in science. Ironically, it was this very faith that would lead his team to disaster. They planned so scientifically, they tried to figure out how they would put what resources they had and what nature would normally be expected to throw at them together and be able to succeed. And they would have succeeded in a normal year. In November of 1910, Robert Scott arrived in the Antarctic aboard the ship Terra Nova. He established his base camp in a hut at Cape Evans. And on November 1st, 1911, after a year of preparation, he set off for the pole. Two weeks later, Scott and his party of 16 men, 10 ponies and 22 dogs arrived at a location 150 miles inland. They called the site One Ton Depot because earlier in the year, members of the expedition had journeyed there to leave over a ton of supplies. One ton was to be the springboard for their assault on the pole and a safety valve for their return. Despite all their planning and stockpiling of provisions, the odds were against them making it to the pole. Scott himself had failed in an attempt eight years earlier, as had Shackleton in 1909. The continent of Antarctica is larger than India and China combined, and from Scott's hut at Cape Evans, the trek to the pole was more than 900 miles. The first part of the journey would take them 400 miles across the featureless Ross ice shelf. Then they would have to climb the 125 mile long Beardmore Glacier. Finally, at an altitude of 10,000 feet, the team would face the final 370 mile slog to the pole itself. If they made it, they would then have to retrace their steps back to the safety of the hut. Scott's expedition was financed by the Royal Geographical Society which expected him not only to reach the pole, but also to oversee rigorous scientific research while he was there. Scott was tremendously interested in science. I mean, not only was he proud of the fact that he was leading the biggest scientific expeditions that had ever gone down south, it was much deeper than that. He 
derived enormous intellectual satisfaction from the scientific work which was being done by his team. He was hugely curious about it. Scott was the leader of a well-financed and highly publicized Antarctic expedition. He was equipped with the very best technology available, and he had surrounded himself with the most accomplished scientists he could find. Herbert Ponting, the team's official photographer, made a film documenting the expedition and the scientific work being done. Outside the hut, Lieutenant Evans would spend hours with his telescope, making astronomical observations. An intensely cold job, which demanded stoical quality. Among others, the presence of meteorologist George Simpson was featured on the film. Inside the hut, the meteorologist Dr. Simpson had a vast collection of scientific instruments for studying weather conditions. Surgeon Atkinson did research work with his microscope. Simpson, nicknamed Sonny Jim, became indispensable to Scott. He was responsible for recording and analyzing the Antarctic weather, and Scott respected him immensely. The feeling was mutual. Simpson said that he had never met anyone who had the scientific spirit so utterly unalloyed. All of the scientists particularly admired him. Uh, they all talked about him as being someone who could get to the nub of any scientific question immediately. But later critics of Scott claimed he had made irrational decisions. These claims did not sit well with Solomon, who discovered much evidence to the contrary. Wherever she looked, she found signs that Scott had been a meticulous planner. The scientific method seemed to be at the heart of his preparations. Captain Scott used to spend a lot of his time in his little den writing up his journal and working out plans for the journey to the pole. For every detail had to be carefully thought out beforehand. Scott devised a careful plan. Knowing that it would be impossible for the men to carry all their supplies with them, he had ordered a series of earlier journeys into the interior to stockpile provisions along the route. For transport across the ice shelf, Scott chose ponies, because Shackleton had had success with them two years earlier. Dogs and motorized tractors would provide minimal backup support, and the ponies would be slaughtered en route to provide food. Once at the Beardmore Glacier, the men would hold their own supplies. This would be grueling on the outbound trek, but Scott was counting on light loads and a strong tailwind to drive them back to the depots on the return. Each leg of the journey had its own carefully thought out team. A party of 16 would set out from base camp to help carry provisions. At the glacier, half the men and the two dog teams would turn back, while the other eight men continued on. When they reached the plateau, Scott would select three men to accompany him on the final leg. Timing would be crucial. In order to beat the onset of winter, the team had to be back at Cape Evans by the end of March. Scott had thought through every detail. How many units of food the men would need per day, how many miles they would have to average on the polar plateau and on the ice shelf. For Solomon, there was nothing sloppy about Scott's preparation. I think Scott tried to plan the journey to the pole very much as a scientist and as an engineer, in a sense. He tried to figure out what it would take and how he would do it. That's very much, I think, the modern way. It's, in a sense, he was a man ahead of his time. As they approached the top of the Beardmore Glacier, the excitement began to grow. They were nearing the end of the second leg, and it was almost time for Scott to pick his final team for the actual assault on the pole. It had been 40 days since they left One Ton Depot, and the going had been difficult. A blizzard had delayed them near the base of the glacier, and the ponies had struggled through the heavy snow. But Scott had pressed them to make up time, and they were now back on track. The team had finished with the ponies and was now relying on man-hauling, 
Each 800-pound sledge was pulled by a team of four men. In addition to his race against winter, Scott had another reason to push the pace. On the way to Antarctica, he had found out that Norwegian explorer Raoul Amundsen, who had lost his bid to become the first to the North Pole, was now trying to beat Scott to the south. Scott realized that actually it was going to be a race between the two of them and that Amundsen could very well get there before him. But at the same time, he tried to push that out of his mind because he was, I think, just as interested for much of the time about the scientific achievement that he hoped would come from his expedition, the work that his team that he was taking down there was going to do. Above the Beardmore, Scott was feeling confident. At the last minute, he decided on a polar party of five instead of the four he had originally intended. Perhaps he wanted to reward as many as possible for the hard work they had done to reach that point. Scott's critics regard this change as a crucial mistake. But Solomon is convinced that while it may have led to discomfort, it was not a big enough gaffe to derail the expedition. The problem with having five men uh, had in part to do with the fact that it took longer to cook for five than four. Scott uh, confessed that. It was a big problem. It took a half an hour more. The tent was really too small for five men. Uh, somebody would get kind of pushed off the floor cloth on, on, onto the edge of the, of the tent. That's obviously not a good situation. Um, so for, for many reasons, having five instead of four was a mistake, but I don't think it would have been a fatal one. Finally, on the Antarctic Plateau, the men continued to trudge southward. Their spirits were high, but they were beginning to grow tired after nearly 60 days of marching, dragging their sledges behind them. On January 9th, they passed the southernmost point reached by Shackleton in 1909. They were now walking on virgin ground. Scott was still confident. It is wonderful that two long marches would land us at the Pole. We left our depot today with nine days' provisions so that it ought to be a certain thing now. Scott had good reason to anticipate success. His team was making excellent progress, and he was impressed with the men he had chosen for the final push. Edmund Wilson, the expedition's chief scientist was a doctor and a talented artist, and Scott's best friend. Henry Bowers, nicknamed Bertie for his prominent nose, was known for his exceptional stamina. Lawrence Oates, the aristocratic but unassuming army captain, had been in charge of the ponies on the expedition. and seaman Edgar Evans. He was the strong man of the group. By the middle of January, the men had covered nearly 900 miles. They had climbed 10,000 feet up a glacier strewn with crevasses, and they had survived on rations of dried meat and lard. Now, they were approaching their final destination. On January 17, 1912, the team reached the pole. But the glory that Scott had dreamed of was denied him, for he was met by the sight of a tent flying the Norwegian flag. Amundsen, Scott's great rival, had beaten him to the pole. It was a crushing blow. The wind is blowing hard, temperature is minus 21, and there is that curious, damp, cold feeling in the air which chills one to the bone in no time. Great God, this is an awful place and terrible enough for us to have labored to it without the reward of priority. Amundsen's strategy had been very different from Scott's. Relying on his experience from the Arctic, he had foregone careful planning and made a dash for the pole. He had taken a gamble and won, beating Scott by a full five weeks. Amundsen got to the pole first because of his transport arrangements. Very simple, a few men on skis with lots of dogs. He was able to take less time getting to 
the pole and back again, and he was able to eat the dogs uh, as they traveled. He knew about traveling over snow and ice. He knew about the cold. They had not been first, but Scott's men planted the British flag and then began the long journey home. Scott's preparations had served them well, and they believed they would quickly make it back to the safety of the coast, even though Edgar Evans was beginning to have problems with frostbite. Scott's confidence came from his careful planning and from his understanding of the weather data that meteorologist Simpson had provided him. In fact, Solomon found that Scott was counting on the weather to bring them home. I had to really step back in time because a critical part of putting the pieces of the puzzle together was actually getting a sense of the, the science that they did, their approach to understanding the weather, to have a sense of whether or not they just blindly sauntered out into Antarctica not knowing what would happen or whether they actually tried to figure out what they ought to expect. Solomon was surprised to discover just how attentive Scott had been to the weather and just how determined Simpson had been to understand it. Long before the advent of modern forecasting equipment, they had attempted something that had never been done in Antarctica. They had based their schedule on a prediction of the weather. Simpson very carefully tried to understand what the weather should be like. To figure out how you'd get to the pole and get back, the weather was going to be a key component of that process, and Scott's writings make it clear that he was worried about that, that he and Simpson talked about it. He wrote in his diaries many times, the temperature is minus 17, inform Simpson. You know, remember to talk about this with Simpson. In Simpson, Scott had found a man who matched his own passion for science. Simpson had been born into a family of umbrella makers in Derby, England. His father established a department store bearing the family name, and Simpson was expected to follow in his father's footsteps. But the boy showed an uncanny ability in science and instead became the first member of his family to go to university. His advisor there was a personal friend of Scott's and he recommended Simpson for the polar expedition. He was an amazing guy. The insights that, that Simpson had into many different aspects of Antarctic meteorology are, are just incredible. Uh, he was the first to figure out why the Antarctic summer is colder than the Arctic summer. He was the first to really launch balloons in the Antarctic and study how the temperatures changed as a function of altitude, which was a, a really stunning achievement. Uh, he was clearly a scientist of, of tremendous capability. As Solomon pored over the data in Simpson's papers, she realized she was looking at something truly remarkable. In front of her, on the yellowing pages of century-old diaries, were the first ever forecasts of the Antarctic interior. Composed from Simpson's observations in the year prior to the push for the pole, Solomon examined every detail of the forecasts. I wasn't prepared for what I found looking at Simpson's books and other documents. It's incredible to me that, that he was able to piece together enough information about the weather to make a remarkably accurate forecast for what the conditions ought to have been like for the journey to the pole and the entire journey back. The way he did that was, was just amazing. Simpson predicted that the temperature at the Cape Evans base camp would be warmer than the Antarctic interior. Not simply because of the natural warming effect of the ocean, but also because the nearby mountains blocked the cold winds coming off the ice shelf. He built a weather station just above the hut, where readings of temperature, wind speed, and wind direction were taken on an hourly basis. To get data from the interior, he trained the men to take temperature readings three times a day on every one of their depot supply journeys. By comparing the records from the depot trips with the corresponding measurements from Cape Evans, Simpson came to the conclusion that throughout the year, the ice shelf was consistently 20 degrees colder than Cape Evans. From his findings, 
he was able to forecast the temperature on the ice shelf for every month of the polar journey. Simpson's approach was years ahead of its time, but it remained to be seen how accurate his predictions really were. Over the last 20 years, technology has allowed modern scientists to learn a great deal about Antarctica's weather patterns. One of the most powerful tools in this quest to unravel the continent's secrets is a network of automated weather stations that gather temperature, wind, and other meteorological data every day of the year, sending it via satellite to labs around the world. Examining this archive, Solomon was quickly able to work out typical temperatures for every month of Scott's journey. When she compared her modern results to Simpson's 1911 predictions, she was amazed to discover that Simpson's forecasts were never more than three degrees off. How cold would it be at the pole in January? He figured that out. How cold would it be on the ice shelf? How cold would it be on the last part of the journey? He had all of that nailed to, to a T. When Scott left the pole, he was relying on Simpson's forecast for the return journey. He had planned his schedule around the temperatures he knew he could expect, and so far, everything had gone according to plan. The team made its way back across the high plateau, and as Simpson had predicted, temperatures hovered near a frigid negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The party was averaging more than 15 miles a day, but Edgar Evans was suffering from worsening frostbite, and his situation was getting serious. Evans was beginning to lose heart. Evans is the chief anxiety now. His cuts and wounds suppurate. His nose looks very bad. And altogether, he shows considerable signs of being played out. Things may mend for him on the glacier, and his wounds get some respite under warmer conditions. The men's spirits rose when they arrived back at the Beardmore. But on the way down, Evans sustained a severe head injury when he and Scott fell into a crevasse. Scott had hoped the warmer temperatures on the ice shelf would help Evans recover. But after the accident, his situation began to look hopeless. His comrades encouraged him to push on, but two weeks later, Evans collapsed. I was first to reach the poor man and shocked at his appearance. He was on his knees with clothing disarranged and a wild look in his eyes. We got him on his feet, but after two or three steps, he sank down again. He showed every sign of complete collapse. Wilson, Bowers and I went back to the sledge while Oates remained with him. When we returned, he was practically unconscious and we got him into the tent quite comatose. He died quietly at 12.30 a.m. Frostbite had taken its toll, but Wilson, the team doctor, documented the cause of death as brain damage. Evans had been done in by a freak accident, something no amount of planning could have prevented. There was nothing the team could do but bury him and move on. With Evans gone, the men quickened their pace. The day after they buried their friend, Scott, Wilson, Oates, and Bowers approached their resupply depot near the base of the glacier. They were finally back on the ice shelf. Here, stockpiles of food and fuel awaited them. At last, the frigid temperatures of the plateau were supposed to be behind them. Simpson's forecast called for strong tailwinds and much more moderate temperatures. They were still 400 miles away from Cape Evans, but they expected the worst was behind them. The very first night that they regained the barrier, Scott talked about how they've had a good night's sleep for a change because it was so nice and warm. They weren't even worried when they got back down to the Ross Ice Shelf. At that point, they thought they had it made. 
For the next six days, everything went according to plan. But on February 27th, the temperature suddenly dropped to a brutal 37 degrees below zero. This was far worse than anything they had experienced on the plateau. For the first time, a hint of uncertainty entered Scott's writing. Desperately cold last night. Pray God we have no further setbacks. We may find ourselves in safety at next depot, but there is now a horrid element of doubt. The doubts did not let up. Brief periods of such bitter cold were manageable, but for days, the thermometer refused to budge, only once rising above negative 30. The men were stunned by the unexpected weather. Wilson and Bowers had survived worse temperatures on an earlier research expedition, but never for this long, and never after four months of exhausting manholing. It's not just the fact that it was cold. It was cold for three and a half straight weeks. You probably can't appreciate what the impact of that is on the human body unless you've actually been through it. Those kind of temperatures are absolutely killing. Scott's carefully laid plans were in tatters, and the lives of his men hung in the balance. The staggering cold had thrown his schedule into disarray, and everyone was nearing exhaustion. The sledges became harder and harder for the straining men to pull. The surface, lately a very good, hard one, is coated with a thin layer of woolly crystals. These are too firmly fixed to be removed by the wind and cause impossible friction on the runners. God help us, we can't keep up this pulling. That is certain. Normally, friction from the sledge melts a thin layer of snow that lubricates the runners as they slide. But below negative 20, the snow remains crystalline and grips the runners tightly. Sir Ranulph Fiennes, a polar explorer who pulled a sledge across Antarctica in 1993, knows all too well what Scott and his men had struggled with. We developed a real feeling for the problems that Scott faced from day to day with the, the variety of snow surfaces and temperatures. If you want to practice it, you want to get two six-foot fat men, put them into a bathtub with no legs, and pull them for in his case 1600 miles over sand dunes. That's the friction that you actually get. There's no sliding. But even as the conditions got worse, Scott made no effort to lighten the load. It is a decision his critics have often cited as a clear indication of his incompetence. Three weeks earlier, the party had spent a day collecting 30 pounds of rock samples on the plateau. So when the going got rough, why didn't Scott dump the extra weight? Fine says lightening the load would have made little difference. Pulling sledges is a very unpredictable thing. You can halve the load of a sledge and have bad snow and go slower than the full load of the sledge with good snow. So the great thing about putting a few rocks, 30 pounds of rocks on their sledges wouldn't have made much difference. They weren't stupid. They weren't going to keep them on the sledge if it was really killing them. They could have just depoted them and come back for them the following year. What was killing them wasn't the, the weight of the rocks. It was the friction of the snow. The unyielding surface had a devastating effect on their progress. Instead of averaging 15 miles a day, they could barely manage three and a half. At this rate, they would never make it back to Cape Evans in time to beat the onset of winter when temperatures would drop to an unsurvivable 50 below. To make matters worse, the tailwind that Scott had been expecting, another crucial element of Simpson's forecast, was also failing to materialize. Hope for better things this afternoon, but no improvement apparent. Oh, for a little wind. On the previous journeys back from the depots, the teams had erected sails on the sledges when the wind began to blow from the south. Scott had calculated this added advantage into his plans. So without it, his team was in even more trouble. The wind had aided them before, 
But this time, the air stayed bitter and still. The surface remains awful. The cold intense, and our physical condition running down. God help us, not a breath of favorable wind for more than a week. The elements were unyielding. They were trapped in a condition we now call a temperature inversion. The reflective surface of the ice loses energy rapidly, creating a layer of cold air sandwiched between the ground and a warmer layer above. Only wind can bring the warm air back down to ground level. But for Scott, the wind refused to arrive. When it's windy, it's actually warm in the Antarctic. I know that sounds terribly counterintuitive, but, but many of the warmest days you'll have down there in Antarctic winter have just enough wind to keep things stirred up. Frigid temperatures and no wind had left the team with little hope. They were now relying on sheer force of will to get them home. But the situation was still getting worse. As they weakened, they became more vulnerable to frostbite a polar explorer's greatest fear. Captain Oates was the first to succumb. Poor Oates got it again in the foot. It is only with the greatest pains the rest of us keep off frostbite. No idea there could be temperatures like this at this time of year. We know now that when we tend to go from minus 20 Fahrenheit and we cross to about minus 30 Fahrenheit, there is um, quite of a sharp increase in the chance of, of development of frostbite. In fact, the chance go from about 50% to about 95% within that range. Frostbite on their feet was the greatest danger, for if they couldn't march, they would die where they fell. The simple ability to keep their socks dry became a matter of life and death. Very cold nights now, and cold feet starting March, as day footgear doesn't dry at all. Wet material loses heat 25 times faster than dry, and the cold tents never gave their clothes an opportunity to shed moisture. In fact, the tents were so cold that the men's socks froze solid at night, causing another grave problem every morning. Before beginning the day's march, they had to spend an hour and a half struggling to get their damaged feet into their footwear. It was an agonizing ritual that cost them valuable walking time and left their feet ever more susceptible to the chill. Their feet would have been raw in many places, so you don't want to press raw flesh uh, against um, a rock-hard sleeping bag. It's one of the most painful things on earth. I, I, I remember for about 70 days every morning trying to put my feet, which were gangrenous, with bare-ended toes with no flesh on them, uh, firstly into socks. I mean, it, it was painful even putting the sock on, and then trying to put them into our, our ski boots, which were rock-hard. How are Scots men not only had that problem every morning, but the problem which we didn't have, which was to not be able to get into their sleeping bags when they were still retaining body warmth from the movement of the day, is unthinkable. I mean, they were very, very brave men, all five of them. But brave as they were, Oates's condition was deteriorating rapidly. This was his second bout with frostbite, and skin that has been damaged once is far more vulnerable to re-injury. His odds of survival were plummeting. Oates is wonderfully plucky, as his feet must be giving him great pain. He makes no complaint, but his spirits only come up in spurts now, and he grows more silent in the tent. If we were all fit, I should have hopes of getting through. But the poor soldier has become a terrible hindrance, though he does his utmost and suffers much, I fear. The team's options were running out. On March 10th, Oates asked Wilson whether he had any chance of pulling through. The doctor said he didn't know. In point of fact, he has none. Apart from him, if he went under now, I doubt whether we could get through. The weather conditions are awful, and our gear gets steadily more icy and difficult to manage. <laughs> 
the party had endured 13 days of temperatures below negative 30. In such conditions, water freezes in under a minute. Fingers bond instantly to metal. Humans exist here at the very margins of survival. Oates is very near the end, one feels. He is a brave fellow and understands the situation, but he practically asked for advice. Nothing could be said but to urge him to march as long as he could. A few days later, Oates requested that Scott leave him in his sleeping bag. He said he could go no further and knew he was holding the rest of them back. His companions begged him to rally and he relented, but the cold was quickly overcoming him. Three days later, with the temperature now negative 43 degrees Fahrenheit, Oates took matters into his own hands. Oates slept through the night, hoping not to wake. But he woke in the morning. It was blowing a blizzard. He said, I'm just going outside and maybe some time. He went out into the blizzard and we have not seen him since. We knew that poor Oates was walking to his death, but though we tried to dissuade him, we knew it was the act of a brave man and an English gentleman. We all hope to meet the end with a similar spirit, and assuredly the end is not far. Their group was down to three, but only 160 miles separated them from the safety, warmth, and food at Cape Evans. If the cold broke and they could increase their daily mileage, they might still have a chance. 11 miles a day would mean only two more weeks on the ice. But the day after Oates' death, Scott found himself in trouble. During a bout of violent indigestion, he failed to notice when his right foot began to freeze. Within minutes, his toes were severely frostbitten. There is no chance to nurse one's feet. Amputation is the least I can hope for now. But will the trouble spread? Scott made only a few more diary entries after that. On March 21st, he wrote that the party was now only 11 miles from the depot at One Ton Camp. But a blizzard had stopped them in their tracks, and they were nearly out of fuel. Their only hope was for Wilson and Bowers to depart for the depot alone. Wilson and Bowers unable to start. Must be near the end. Have decided it shall be natural. We shall march for the depot with or without our effects and die in our tracks. But they never marched again. In his last diary entry, dated March 29th, Scott wrote that the blizzard had raged for 10 days, keeping them trapped in the tent. I do not think we can hope for any better things now. We shall stick it out to the end. But we are getting weaker, of course, and the end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write more. For God's sake, look after our people. Bowers composed a last letter to his mother. As this may possibly be my last letter to you, I am sorry it is such a short scribble. We have had a terrible journey back. When man's extremity is reached, God's help may put things right. It is splendid to pass, however, with such companions as I have. I should so like to come through for your dear sake. Much and dearest love to your dear self, and May, and Edie. Wilson wrote to his wife, Oriana. My love is as living for you as ever. We will all meet after death, and death has no terrors. Don't be unhappy, darling. All is for the best. We are playing a good part in a great scheme arranged by God himself. And all is well. Scott wrote a letter he titled, Message to the Public. In it, he listed the reasons the expedition had failed. He stressed that the logistics, the food supplies, clothing and depots, had worked out to perfection. Then, 
He described the weather they'd faced on the ice shelf. No one in the world would have expected the temperatures and surfaces which we encountered at this time of year. Our wreck is certainly due to this sudden advent of severe weather, which does not seem to have satisfactory cause. I do not think human beings ever came through such a month as we have come through. Scott blamed the weather, but he was careful in his choice of words. Susan Solomon believes Scott's final note also contained a redemptive message to his meteorologist and friend, George Simpson. I think I know why he said no one. Because he wanted Simpson to understand that he was not blaming him for the fact that the forecast didn't turn out to be right. He was saying, look, Sonny Jim, you couldn't have forecast this. No one in the world could have forecast this. And we're dying, but it's not your fault. Prior to his departure, Scott had briefed the support teams that the Polar Party would return to Cape Evans by late March. As the days turned into weeks, the 13 men back in the hut grew increasingly worried. But there was little they could do as winter set in. April became May, and the sun sank lower and lower on the horizon enveloping the continent in another long, cold, Antarctic winter. It was another six months before a recovery team could set out across the ice shelf. After two weeks of searching, one of the men saw the tip of Scott's tent sticking out of the winter snow. The search party recovered the men's diaries and letters. Scott's favorite hymn was sung and the commanding officer read some of their last words aloud. Then they removed the tent poles and allowed the canvas to shroud their lifeless comrades' bodies. They built a large snow cairn and erected a cross, then headed back to Cape Evans. It took a year for the news of Scott's death to reach George Simpson. Simpson had seen Scott off from Cape Evans, but soon after had been recalled from Antarctica and sent to work at the British Meteorological Office in India. He found Scott's death extremely difficult to deal with. The news of the sad disaster came to India in such drills that it was nearly a fortnight before I could really understand what happened. I could not have imagined that the sad news would have affected me so much. Simpson began reviewing all his records and forecasts, trying to see for himself what had gone wrong. Was it a mistake he had made, or had Antarctica dealt them an unwinnable hand? At some level, I'm sure he blamed himself. I'm sure that he asked himself, well, you know, could I have done it better? What did I miss? How did I screw up? And he had to be asking himself those questions. And therefore, he was driven, I'm sure, by a sense of tremendous sadness over the fact that these men had died and that he had, in some way, played, played a role. Six years later, Simpson published the first of a painstaking three-volume study on the meteorology of Antarctica. In it, he concluded that the temperatures recorded by Scott's party on the ice shelf in March 1912 were nearly 40 degrees colder than those at Cape Evans. It was a difference he knew was not typical. 1912, he theorized, must have been an abnormal year, but he didn't have the data to prove it. Simpson absolutely nailed it. He not only figured out what the weather should have been like for the polar party, but he also looked at what they actually experienced and understood how unusual it was. He figured out that they would have made it back in about nine out of 10 years. Turns out he was a little conservative. It's more like 15 out of 16. I, mean, I don't think you have to be a scientist to be stunned by that, to be in awe of that man's insights. Nearly 90 years after Simpson's forecast, Solomon was able to prove that his work had been perfect. But she had the benefit of the modern weather stations with their constant measurements, while Simpson 
could only rely on his more crude readings. His forecasts were stunningly accurate, but in the end, they made no difference. 1912 was such an aberration, there is no way Simpson could have predicted it. To see that, that this man correctly predicted what it would take for those men to survive, what they ought to have had in terms of very survivable weather on the way back, and that he died not knowing that he was right, was an incredibly moving and, and, and really quite um, important experience for me. It, it almost drove me to tears. Simpson's work was ahead of its time, and no one picked up on his conclusions about the disaster. He moved to London soon after he published his findings, which were so dense and technical, few could understand them. He soon buried himself in other work. He'd lived in his study, had a big study in, in that biggish house that we lived in there. And he simply stayed in there all the time and didn't come out except to eat a meal, that sort of thing. And um, I used to go in as a child to kiss him goodnight on my way to bed. But then he didn't even always look up and notice. And I remember coming out saying, Daddy doesn't love me, <laughs> because um, I simply hadn't been able to get any response out of him at all. Simpson presented his views about the role of the weather in Scott's death only once, in a scientific lecture he gave in 1923. Then, he never spoke publicly about it again. Simpson was a very meticulous and careful scientist, and I think he would have been reluctant to talk about the weather as an issue very much because he couldn't prove that it was unusual. I couldn't have proved it either until um, all that nice weather station data was accumulated. So it, it, it had to be somewhat by extrapolation that he made his argument, and I think as a good scientist, he probably would be uncomfortable with that. Solomon's work had established Simpson's legacy as a scientist and had also shattered many of the myths about Scott's ineptitude. But she was still troubled by one aspect of the story. The thing that kept bothering me at the end was the way they died. Scott and his men made camp on March 19th for the last time. They never left it. March 29th is the date of Scott's last diary entry. It's been thought that a blizzard is what kept them in the tent for 10 full days. But if you've been to that part of the Antarctic, you know that blizzards just don't last more than two or three days. And if they had a 10-day blizzard, my, my God, they had the blizzard of a century. And then suddenly I realized that it actually couldn't have happened. Scott's own men provide the observations that, that show that there was no blizzard. Two men, Atkinson and Kahane, went out onto the Ross Ice Shelf to look for Scott and Bowers and, and Wilson. They didn't go very far, but they were experiencing light winds, temperatures of zero to minus 17, perfect weather for, for keeping on going. This was on March 27th. So on March 27th, or maybe even before, the wind had already stopped. That made clear that the reason that the three of them stayed in the tent was not a meteorological reason. It had to be a human reason. And that, I, I realized, was probably the fact that Scott's foot was very badly frostbitten. Wilson, who was a doctor, wrote to his parents that Scott could scarcely walk. He didn't say anything about a blizzard in that letter to his parents. He said that he loved them, that he would see them in heaven, and that the captain just couldn't go on. And so I believe that Wilson and Bowers decided that they simply couldn't accept going on without him and they perhaps misled him into thinking that the blizzard was still raging. Bowers had tremendous loyalty to Scott. He wrote to his mother that I am Captain Scott's man and will stick by him right through. Wilson, who, who was a doctor, had talked about if he were ever with a sick companion, he would not be able to abandon that companion, no matter what. Wilson and Bowers are probably the, the truest heroes of, of this whole story, if what I'm saying is, is, is correct. <laughs>
because not only did they probably sacrifice themselves, but they did it in silence. They didn't actually write or say what they were doing. I think they were too loyal to do that. Scott would not have known what his comrades had done for him. But in his final hours, he revealed how highly he thought of them. He wrote letters to their families, making sure they would know how decent each had been. To Bauer's mother. I write when we are very near the end of our journey, and I am finishing it in company with two gallant, noble gentlemen. One of these is your son. As the troubles have thickened, his dauntless spirit ever shone brighter, and he has remained cheerful, hopeful, and indomitable to the end. My whole heart goes out in pity for you. To Wilson's wife. If this letter reaches you, Bill and I will have gone out together. We are very near it now, and I should like you to know how splendid he was at the end everlastingly cheerful and ready to sacrifice